Does anyone have their copy of the sanctuary still? I am. Sister Patricia, she's going to go and make some more copies of these. We have a couple here moving, but she's going to make some more copies of them right now. But uh, this whole year, every time I came, we were dealing with the sanctuary and the blessed pattern of the sanctuary. The blessed pattern of the sanctuary. We're going to do a quick recap. We're going to do a quick recap. Wait until we get. I'll wait until we get the the copies. That way, you can all have a copy to look at while we do this quick recap. But again, you know how the Holy Spirit works. The Sabbath school lessons and the verse that my sister brought up today has everything to do with my sermon. And I said it when we were going over the lesson. I said, "Wow, that's just affirmation of the Holy Spirit." And, how he works. Amen. How he works. Matter of fact, let's let's we'll, we'll start it. We'll begin it in a way. Now, a lot of times I call this the unhidden piece of the sanctuary. The unhidden piece, and that's the gate. That's the gate. But now a lot of people, a lot of teachers of the sanctuary, they just start with the altar of burnt offering. The labor, then they go to the showbread, the altar of incense, the seven branch candlestick, and the ark. But if you count the pieces of the sanctuary, how many pieces do we count here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six, mm -hmm. six is the number of man, it's incompleteness. But it's seven mm -hmm. if you count the gate also. Mm -hmm. If you count the gate also. There's no more completeness. And as we know, there, there is no coincidence with God and how he orchestrates things. This thought hit me. I'll share this before the recap. This thought literally hit me the other day when thinking about the sanctuary. If I wanted something, if I wanted to say right here on earth, I want to see a little piece of heaven. If I said something that's in heaven right now, I wish I could see it. It's the sanctuary. Did you know the sanctuary is the only structure, place, and building? <clears throat> Can I have someone pass these out? And I have. That's not enough. I have two more copies of it. But it, it, it hit me one day that the sanctuary is the only structure or place that's patterned and copied after the, something that's in heaven. And directly, like if I wanted to, you know, down to the down to the way that the the table of showbread was made, to the way that the altar of burnt offering was made. So really. What's that saying go with? They say it's a, a little piece of heaven. Hmm. There is no other place that's structured after anything in heaven but the sanctuary. So if you want to say, Father, I want to see a little piece of heaven, you should look to the sanctuary. Look to the sanctuary. But if everybody has a copy now, we'll just do a quick recap. Like I said, this whole past year we've been working on it. The gate which stands for separating. The gate always separates and is where you make a conscious choice to seek the Father. You're either outside the gate, unholy ground, or you're inside, on holy ground. And, and let me reiterate, the sanctuary pattern that we've been working on all year is what, what I call God's blessed assembly line. God's blessed assembly line. And, and that's, that's why I'm recapping, so the is it a beat back fresh? Now what happens in the assembly line method? If you, any of you ever worked on the assembly line. If you forget a piece, the end product is, is yeah, it's, it's not going to be the same. It's going to be messed up. It's going to be malfunctioned. So could that be why God, you know, 
doesn't allow us to just change his furniture around and rearrange his furniture. You know, could that be the point? Because I always said in my head, man, when he struck up, us or down for just touching the ark, could that be why he wouldn't? He won't even allow men, simple men, to just touch it? Because if man could just touch it, they'll be rearranging the furniture around. Like I, like I said before, it's like me going in my mama's house, rearranging her furniture around. I might get struck dead also. <laughs> you know? But the gate stands for separation. Separation. So when, when seeking God, you first have to choose, make a conscious choice to be separate. <clears throat> to be separate. Then after you made a conscious choice that you're going to be separate from the world, you have to embrace the blood of the Lamb. But like we talked about, not only do you embrace the blood of the Lamb, but you also lay your life down in sacrifice as He did on the altar right here. You allow yourself to be burned up. Now, I know myself, I myself fail right here. You know, I'm willing to be separate and different from the world, but sometimes I don't lay all my wants and ambitions and desires down on the altar to be burned up. Sometimes there's a little bit of Joshua trying to seek the Father when Joshua should be burned up right here on the altar. But once I desire to separate, and then I embrace the blood of the Lamb, and I lay down my life on the altar, because I do these things, I'm given a fresh start. Mm -hmm. And this pattern is to be taken daily. So every day I'm given a fresh start. That's at the labor, that's baptism, mm -hmm. cleansing. Because I've allowed my wants and my desires and things that nature and Josh to be burned up, and I've desired to separate, because I've embraced the blood, I'm given a fresh start. I'm given a fresh start. There is no coincidence that the blood comes right before the cleansing. Sin is like the, the stain. It's so worse of a stain that only the blood of God can get it out. Only the blood of God can wash it away. So, but right here I'm giving a fresh start, a new birth. I'm cleansed and we dealt with that before. You know, that, that's the path. It's not me when I say, hey, the minute you believe in the blood, you're giving a fresh start, you're clean then. That's the pattern. The, 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 you know, because some people tell you you're not clean until you do something, as we talked about before. You're clean the minute you embrace the blood. That's the power of the blood. So don't let nobody tell you that you have to do certain things because the devil whisper in your ear, oh, you're not really forgiven until you go, go read your Bible for about three hours. Then you're back good with God. Or, you know, go do this and that, or, or go help somebody out. Then you'll be back good with God. No, the minute you say, Father, forgive me, you're cleansed. That's the pattern. The pattern says you're cleansed right after the blood. And then we have the table of showbread. As we said, you know, I, I, I wake up in the morning. I purpose in my heart I'm going to be separate. Because I purpose in my heart I'm going to be separate, then I, I embrace the blood of Christ upon my life, lay down my life in sacrifice for that day. I said, okay. Father, today I'm laying on my life a sacrifice. And then my mistakes of yesterday, which I personally made many, my wife will attest that the mistakes I made yesterday, I don't have to make them today because I'm giving a fresh start today. And you, you know, like I, like I preached before earlier this year, we can take backpacks of pain with us. You know, even though God has forgiven us, we're carrying the guilt along with us. I don't know if y'all remember that word remission that we worked on. That's the forgotten word of the gospel. You know, a lot of times we hear repentance, but if you if you don't teach remission along with the repentance, your repentance means nothing. Remission is the, the wiping away. I can stop doing something, that's repenting. But say if I stop doing something, but I carry the guilt with me though, I still feel bad. The devil likes you. I still got him. Because you're still carrying that guilt. You're carrying them backpacks of pain. So, like I say, I wake up in the morning, I say I'm going to be separate today. I embrace the blood of Christ on my life. And I lay down my wants and desires for that day. Then, because of that, I, I'm given a fresh start, a new birth. So my mistakes and things I leave in the past, I leave them where they belong. Yesterday, you know, I don't have to take them with me. It's a new birth today. But now that I'm a baby, because right here I'm a baby, it's a fresh start. I'm a baby. But because I'm a baby, now I have to start eating heavenly food, right? If now I'm a child of God now, literally, like we talked about before. I don't know if y'all remember the sermon when we talked about when you embrace the blood, and we're going to touch on this later on today, when you embrace the blood, when you embrace the blood right here, the blood of Christ, we're talking about the blood of God. 
the blood of God mixes with your blood. What's in, what's inside of blood? What 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 thing is inside of blood? DNA. DNA. There we go. We're talking about so so. Let's not look at the blood as as something small when we talk about the blood of God, the blood of Jesus. So Jesus's DNA mixes with you when you go back into this watery grave, or let's say the womb. That's why it's called new birth. So when you go back into the womb, Jesus's DNA mixes with your DNA, and God. You come up literally a child of God. A new child is born inside you. Christ is, starts to, is born inside you. You're literally a child of God. You got the DNA of God inside you. So you do have a, a new birth. And it's literal. It's literal. That's the power of the blood. That's the power of the blood. So you're given this new birth. You have this Christ growing in. Baby Jesus, you're a child of God now. His DNA inside you. So can 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 the Christ in you just eat earthly food? Or does he need heavenly food? Heavenly food. So could that be why the bread is immediately fell after the new birth? Because what's the first thing babies want to do? Like I have my newborn, she's eating now. You know? First thing a child wants to do is eat. You're a newborn baby right here, so for the day. So you got your you got your table of showbread, which we know is the word of God. So now let's go back to the pattern, how you take it daily again. I wake up and I purpose that I'm going to be separate from the world. I embrace the blood of the lamb upon my life for that day. And I lay down my life in sacrifice. And because of that, I'm given a fresh start. I leave my mistakes and the things I made in the past. And, and oh yeah, and, and what we also talk with this, you got to give everybody else a fresh start also. Not only do you leave your mistakes in the past, but you got to give everybody else a fresh start also. So I give everybody that my friends, family, enemies, I give everybody a fresh start also for that day. And then I get make sure, since I'm, I'm a newborn for that day, I, I, I got to make sure I get my nutrition in for the day. That's the bread. I got to make sure I get my nutrition in for the day. And what we're going to talk touch on later, some people just say, I'm good. I read my Sabbath school lesson. I read my word in the morning. Do you just eat one time a day? No, there's a reason why God put his word as food. Because we eat several times a day. Some of us more than us. That's me. So I, sometimes I need my snacks during the day too. I need my snacks. So so I purpose for the day because I left my past behind me. I need my nutrition for the day. Okay. And now I need to get my, my communication on with who I need to communicate with for the day. I need to start... One thing a baby does right after he starts learning to eat is he starts trying to talk. You know what I'm saying? So not only am I getting my nutrition in for the day, but I, I got to learn how to talk all over again. I got to make sure I'm in communication with the right person. And I say communication, even though it stands for prayer, I like to call it communication because a lot of times we come to God and we do all the talking. Well, okay. When sometimes we need to hush and yeah. Lord. Communication is a two-way street, right? Right. And I, and I stressed this before because I, I know sometimes I just say, Father, you know, you're beautiful today. Where I said, Father, you know, you're beautiful. I, I talk with him like I'm talking to you. Because I know sometimes when you get tired of somebody always coming to you with their hand out. Yeah. Honestly, ask yourself how many times you come to God where you ask us. Yeah. I'm telling you, examine yourself. I had to look at me. The only time I, talked, I, I just started laughing. I was like, you're right. I went to bed asking. I woke up asking. During the day, I'm asking. God said, can we just talk sometimes? <laughs> so I got to make sure I get my communication in for the day. If you follow these steps, if you follow these steps truly, you will automatically, your character will automatically start to shine as the seven branch candlestick. If you automatically, if you separate from the world, if you embrace the blood of Christ, and lay your life down and sacrifice. If you leave your past in the, in the past and accept the new birth and give everybody else a clean slate, if you get your proper nutrition in more than just once a day, and if you talking to the right person, you're communicating and you're listening to the Father, you will automatically start to shine. Automatically start to shine. I call this God's blessed blueprint to take you from sinful, dirty, sinner Joshua right here to where you'll be able to stand before the Father 
in the most holy place. Mm. This is his blessed blueprint pattern. and can be taken daily. Mm. It, it, there's no limit to how many times it, I, mm. I messed up real bad yesterday. My wife didn't tell you. I, went, I messed up real bad yesterday. I took the pattern again when I got home in my head mentally. You know, I didn't get out and say, all right, baby, I'm taking the pattern. No, I just went through it again in my head. I said, you know, Father, I need to start all over. What did Paul say? Paul said, I die daily. Mm. If he died daily, that means he rolls when? Daily. 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 He, he took himself outside of the pattern so he could go back through it daily. Daily. So today, that's just recapping what we've been going over all year. Because I'm telling you, this pattern saved my life. I would not be able to stand up here and speak to you if God had not taught me to the sanctuary pattern. Mm -hmm. For my guilt and my shame would be, I'd be too overrun. Right now, yeah. even from the, the mistakes I made yesterday, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm being honest with you, I wouldn't be able to stand up here today, you know, if it wasn't for the mercy and love of God, for me knowing, that, hey, Josh, I made new today, <laughs> because of His blood, I'm, I'm clean today, I'm clean. No matter how much the devil will lie and whisper to you and throw and throw them old sins and regrets back up in your mind, let go of those suitcases. You're clean today. So right now, we, we dealt with justification. If y'all remember my last sermon here, we dealt with justification. And that was the belief that the blood instantly cleanses you. That's justification. The blood instantly cleanses you. But what comes after justification? Sanctification. Sanctification. And that's the word sanctification means to be set apart. To be set apart for holy use. Now that's the part sometimes I used to leave out. But you are to be set apart but for holy use. We're not just to be set apart so we can do our own thing. Or set apart so we can live nice lives. We are to be set apart for holy use. Now a, a quick explanation of justification and sanctification. I love this example when I heard Brother Dwayne Lemon teach it. You have a woman clean the house. She cleaned the house. Floor. Let me use example. My my young daughter Aisha. Aisha playing outside. The woman done cleaned the house, mopped the floor. The floor is clean. Justified. House is clean. Aisha come bolting through. Mud all on the shoes. House get muddied up. You know what I'm saying? Aisha bolt through. Really didn't pay attention. Brother told her to stay out the house. You know what I'm saying? To, so Aisha runs outside. Brother sitting there looking. The floor is still muddy. Again. Got back muddy again. Sanctification is the mom having to clean it again. That's how simple it is. See, justification, yes, Jesus justified us, but it's the Holy Spirit who takes you day to day, who sanctifies you, helps you stay clean. <coughs> See, it's one thing, the devil wants you to stay, he wants the world to just stay in justification. That's that saying, once saved, always saved. That is the justification. People, I call them courtyard Christians. Because in the courtyard, if we look at, uh, like we're talking about, the courtyard is where you're justified. That was the work of Christ. It's Christ who justified the whole world. But the holy place is where the Holy Spirit works. It's he who sanctifies. So here's another line. This is my personal one. God, and these things are crucial to understand as we set up today's lesson. God and man was like this. Be able to commune together. Sin came and put a grand canyon in between God and man. Remember, there's a Grand Canyon here, a gulf between God and man. Jesus came and put a bridge. That's the justify. He justified the whole world. He made it possible for man to come back to God. It's the bridge. But what's the problem here? Man is still where? On the other side of the bridge. Even though Jesus justified us, there's a bridge there. Man still got to walk. Across. across the bridge. Love. So it's the Holy Spirit who comes, grabs hold of man, and walks you across the bridge to the Father. That's your daily sanctification. And before the sanctuary, I did not know. I used to hear that word all the time growing up. Sanctification, sanctifying. I didn't know what it meant until I learned the sanctuary pattern and saw how simple God is. What three pieces of furniture are in the holy place? The table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the seven branch candlestick. So could God be saying that once you once you determine to separate, because you gotta do these things first, or they will affect your sanctification. Let me say this again. Some people try to live a sanctified life 
without separating for sacrifice. Some people try to live a sanctified life by carrying their old sins and regrets and problems in. Right. And it's impossible. You can't live a sanctified life unless you follow these simple little three steps first, separate from the world. Lay down your life and sacrifice as the lamb did. And, and give everybody a clean slate and give yourself a clean slate because of the blood. It's the blood who gave you the clean slate. Now, once you do these things and you follow them justly, then, then what is it? All you have to do daily is read your word. Stay in communication with the Father and let your light shine. And I got to stress, the seven branch candlestick, what we say, seven is the number of perfection, right? Mm -hmm. Could it be why it's a seven branch candlestick? It's because you need could it be why it's a seven branch candlestick because God wants you to shine in every area of your life now this is I was talking to my wife about this today and last night because my temperament I had my family we prayed together and prayed over my temperament my anger because that was the part sometimes you could you could shine you could be a light at church but when you go home you can be a totally different person you can be the light in your home but when you go to work, you're a totally different person. Could God be saying you're not a complete light until you can shine in every area of your life? Right. And that's why it's seven branches. That's so simple. See, it's the devil who complicates things. And I, and I didn't know that until I learned to say to your prayer. So all I have to do is, I'm like, Lord, you're telling me that every day all I have to do is purpose to be separate, lay down my life, my wants and my desires. Accept the new birth. Stay in my Bible daily, every day. Stay in communication with the Father. And let my life shine. And I'll be acceptable to stand in front of your throne one day. God is simple. God is simple. But now we're dealing with going into the holy place. We're dealing, we're going to deal today with the transition from coming here to here. I said, once you, the reason why the sanctuary has, has, has uh, helped my life so much, and I realized, and that's why I've been teaching it everywhere I've been preaching this year, is because once you learn the sanctuary, the whole Bible will open up to you on a whole different level. It'll just open up to you. The Bible said the Bible used to look this big to you, it becomes this big to you. And you start to see things that you never saw before. And we're going to deal with some of that. We're going to deal with some of that right now. You know, matter of fact, let's pray. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, please let me disappear and let your Holy Spirit teach, reach, and guide. In your Son's precious name, we dearly pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Jesus' whole life and 90% of all his teachings was about the sanctuary. But many of us miss it because we're not being taught the sanctuary. We just, I want you to hold it. I'm, I'm going to do a quick, as we, uh, this is going to lay the groundwork for today. This is going to lay the groundwork for today. I'm going to go ahead of my notes. When Jesus, when Jesus was 12 years old, well, let's just say it like this. The first gate, the, the, the gate means separation. Jesus' whole life is patterned after the sanctuary pattern. You might say, Josh, Josh, what do you mean? Josh, what do you mean? When Jesus was born, what was he born? In a manger. Mm -hmm. He was born in a manger, in a, in a feeding stall, in a barn for animals. He was born, how many babies today are born in a feeding stall, in a barn for animals? Mm -hmm. Could we say Christ was born separate yep. from most of all mankind? Mm -hmm. yep. Already born on the sacrificing table, mm -hmm. say he'll, he'll be the food for mankind. That's the gate. When he was 12 years old, he told his mom. He was he was 12 years old. That's the age of accountability in Jewish culture. So when he tells his mom when they lost him, when Mary and Joseph lose him, and they find him again and try to blame him, and he kindly rebukes them at 12 years old and say, you're looking for me. Did you know I be by my father's business? That's right. That's right. I, I preached a sermon on this, but I wonder why was the church the last place they looked for the Messiah? I'm not going to get into that right now, but that's just food for thought. Why was the church the last place they looked for the Messiah? Did they forget that they were raising the Messiah? Can we get so caught up sometimes? Remember, Jesus is growing in us too. 
So can we forget sometimes that we have Christ growing in us too? I know I do. I do. Jesus, the manger. Right here at 12, this is where the lamb is slain on the altar. At 12, he said, don't you know I'd be by my father's business? This was the first time he saw the lamb being slain, that he was taken to Jerusalem. When you look at the desire of ages, when you read the desire of ages, this was the first time Jesus had seen this as a child to see what he was prepared. And, and that's why he separated from his parents that day. For they were caught up in talking in the fellowship and his heart was breaking. He was, the whole decision of all mankind was on the shoulders of this child. And the parents was caught up in just fellowshipping with others. And, and, and it made them so sad when you read the observations. He separated from them. Because he, he, he had to make the conscious choice. Are you going to be the lamb? Or are you not going to be the lamb? He made the choice that day. And that's when he said, I am going to be the lamb. And that's when he told his mom, don't you know I'll be by my father's business. That's why I make, it's a big issue that he was 12 when he made the decision. That's the age of accountability. And that's when Jesus Christ chose for himself to lay down his life for all mankind. And so right here, we had the gate, the manger, born as a manger, a babe. Then we have the, the gate. Is when he made the choice. I mean, the, the altar burnt offering, when the, where the lamb is slain. That's where he makes the conscious choice to lay down his life for all mankind at 12 years old. The later, was he not baptized when, when John the Baptist said, Behold, the lamb of the world, the lamb, the word that takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus Christ was baptized. Now you might say, Josh, okay, you might be reaching a little bit. How, how do we know Jesus? You tell me Jesus' life is following the sanctuary pattern? Turn your Bibles to Matthew 4. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4. Let me hear. Amen once you, once you get this. Amen. Amen. Now let's look, let's go back up, just go back up to the end of chapter 3 and verse 16. The end of chapter 3 and verse 16, what we read for our scripture verse, it says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, if we look at the pattern, and this is what I'm trying to tell you today, when you take that pattern and, and you're in the new birth, God looks at you the same way. No matter what mistakes and what things you made yesterday, God looks at you the same way as this is my beloved son and who I am well pleased. Now, look, now, now pay attention to what happens. Now, remember, as we talked about earlier, it's Christ who justifies. That's the courtyard. But the, the holy place is the work of the Holy Spirit. So check this out. Verse 4 of chapter, verse 1 of chapter 4 says, Then was Jesus led up of the Holy Spirit into where? The wilderness. He was, now if we're looking at the sanctuary pattern, it says, once Jesus came out the water, and that happened, then it says, the, whole, the, the Spirit took him and led him into the wilderness. Now I'm just playing, what if the wilderness was the holy place? Now, now I say, Josh, now why would you say that? Well, where, where would you get that from? Let's read verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and a hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, hold on, command that these, what? Stones be made bread. What's the next piece of furniture in the holy place? The table of sugar. Is it a coincidence that the first thing mentioned to Christ after his justification, the first thing mentioned to Christ in his now sanctifying walk is something that has to do with bread. What's the first piece of furniture in the holy place? Show bread. Now I'm going to skip ahead to part two of the sermon real quick. It's verse five. Go down to verse five. Then the devil taking him up into a holy city and setting him on the pinnacle of the temple 
and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. The altar of incense right here in the veils, let's say this was the altar of incense, and you had the table of showbread sitting right here. The veil right here that was behind the altar of incense, there were angels stitched into the veil. So when the incense, when the smoke of the incense would rise up, it was to symbolize the angels taking the incense over the veil to the throne room of God. Can't lose this. This is the second temptation. That's, this is why the Satan brings up, go ahead and cast yourself down. There are angels who are sent to minister to you. But I'm gonna get into that second temptation. This is part two. Right now we're dealing with the bread. But I want you to I want you to see how this is the sanctuary pattern that Christ is going through. Again, right when he was baptized, the first temptation he was dealing with was bread. Now when I saw this, matter of fact, I'll do the third one. Let's let's skip down, let's skip on down ahead, even though this is part two. But I want, I, want you, I want it to be clear to you, honestly. I want it to be clear to you that Jesus right here, him and the devil are in the holy place. And every Christian, once Christ, you're born again. Once you decide to become a Christian. Once you decide to, to, to be born again. And you follow this pattern and the Christ in you starts to grow. Satan tempts you in these three areas of your life as did Christ. Verse same chapter, same chapter, and look at verse 8. It says, again, the devil taking them up into a sea high mountain and showing him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. What does the seven branch have to do with service, shining your light? Yes. Satan wanted Christ to shine his light for him and not for, not for God. Mm -hmm. He was saying, come serve me. Yes. Be my shining light amongst the nations in the kingdom. Yes. Be my superstar, my celebrity. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the, 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 big, the big dollar deal. I'll give you the, the movie contract. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These three temptations, the three temptations of Christ. Why is it, how many temptations was it in there in the wilderness? How many pieces of furniture in the holy place? Three. Now we'll get to the first one. Like I say, now we're going to deal with the transition from the being born again to the table of showbread. Because there's something that's missed here. There were three phases of God's communion with man after being broken in the garden. There were three phases. See, Satan thought he had won. Satan said, okay, if I can break the communication between God and man, because he knew what sin would do. See, he thought he had, he said, okay, I've, I've, I've broken the communicating lines with God and man. But God, he never saw the plan of redemption coming. See, now we can read all about it and see it and know it, and we've heard it our whole life. But back then when it was being played out, Satan didn't know it until, until Genesis 3 when he hears about a child being born. That's his first time hearing about the plan of redemption. He didn't know how God was going to redeem man. Or he thought God was going to wash his hands with man once Adam sinned. That's the truth. He thought, but that's why God said it right there at the sin. God wanted to break his bubble then. God didn't wait. He said, I'm going to break your bubble now. He said, okay, you think you got him. That's why God, God didn't wait. This is why, right when the sin happened. That's why he said, well, guess what? I got a child that's going to be born. And he's going to stomp your head. He didn't wait. Come on. Satan thought he won already. So he thought it because he broke the communicating line. But God, in his ultimate wisdom, see, he never thought that God would do what he did. God said, okay, I can't talk to him. So what I'll do is I'll plant my son in the seed of a woman. Have, her, have him come out as a man, and then I can talk to him through my son. Directly. I can get back to talking to him again. So, so we had they used to be they used to commune with man. Mm -hmm. Then the split happened. 
then Christ was born. Mm -hmm. Then he could commune the man directly through Christ. Then Christ took it spiritual, what we talked about with the DNA of God. See, we got to understand that this is the third phase. See, Satan didn't even see the third phase coming. But then Satan, Satan is no fool. We're talking about, we're talking about up under the Godhead, he was the smartest in all the universe. There was no mind like his in all the universe. Sometimes we think we're dealing with our children. I say it all the time. People believe in God, but many people don't believe in the devil. Because we don't live like it. We don't live like this. There's a beings. We're talking about, we're talking about a whole host of angels. We don't know how many angels there are in heaven. God just said a third fail. Will somebody tell me what's the third of 80, 80, 80 trillion? That's more than more than humans on earth. That's a lot. So we don't know. We're talking about a third of 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 90 million trillion. Fail. So we're dealing with these and they hate you. They look, they hate you. They don't look at you in love. They don't take days off. They're not, they're not, they don't get tired. They don't grow weak. But we live like they take breaks, like we do. <laughs> so God, in his ultimate wisdom, knowing how the world will come, he said, okay, I've come through, I've come on the earth as a man, talk to him directly. Satan got him to kill me just after 33 years. So what I did was, in his genius, like we talked about the DNA, now, through because of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit takes Christ in his blood. Now Christ can grow in us. So God doesn't need any outside exterior means. He can talk directly to us through his son who's supposed to be growing in us. Now if Satan casts all of hell at Christ. Let me read that. Let me read that. Desire of Ages, page 116. Because like I say, sometimes... And, and, I, and I had to be reminded to myself about how serious this war is. Desire of Ages, page 116 says, Satan saw that he must either conquer or be conquered. The issues of the conflict involve too much to be entrusted to his confederate angels. He must personally conduct the warfare. Every Christian needs to hear this. All the energies of apostasy will rally against the Son of God. Sometimes we can think Christ has some easy little cake. Oh, this is all the energies of apostasy will rally against the Son of God. Christ was made the mark of every weapon of hell. And that's word for word. So if you got Christ growing in you, who also has who also has a mark, big mark on their back? You do. And Satan's aim is to keep you in the courtyard. He said, okay, I got to keep him in the courtyard. Why? I got to keep him here. Just believing all they say. I got to keep him here because if they get here, here is where growth takes place. Christ grows inside you here. That's why those three temptations came in Christ. Those three temptations are the three temptations for every Christian. Can you stay in your word daily? Can you live truly by the word of God? Can you live without doubt towards the Father? See, this ultra business, I had to say this for part two. This is a whole other sermon by itself. Because this one is deep right here. When he, when he said, cast yourself off the temple mount and the angels are going to catch you. He was, and, and Jesus said, it's, it's written, I should not tempt the Lord. That word tempt right there meant to prove God. Christ was saying, if, if you don't believe fully in the word, God ain't got to prove himself to you. Because then you'll be seeking for a sign or something every day. Well, Lord, if you want me to have this house, do this. Well, Lord, if you love me, do this. I'm going I'm to I'm get into the second part real quick. If, if somebody doubts you, their whole communication towards you isn't how it should be. Think about it, people who doubt you or think you're a liar. How is their actions towards you? Everything you say, they criticize. Everything you say, they second guess. Why? Because they really don't believe you in the first place. But I'm not going to get into part two. Let's deal with this bread. So what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying is, we now are in the third phase of communion. The first phase 
God you could talk to. Us. The second phase, Satan broke that. The second phase, he had to come through his son. And think about it. If everybody in this room allowed Christ, if Satan couldn't handle Jesus by himself in one person, think if everybody in this room allowed Christ to grow in. That's 30 more Christ that Satan had to deal with. Come on. That's why Satan wants you to stay in that courtyard. He don't, he, don't want you to, he don't want you to allow Christ to grow right here in the holy place. Many look on this conflict between Christ and Satan as having no spiritual bearing on their own life. And for them, it has little interest. But within the domain of every human heart, this controversy is repeated. Never does one leave the ranks of evil for the service of God without encountering the assaults of Satan. If, the name of this sermon is If Thou Be. If Thou Be. You're in your Bibles back at Matthew. You're in your Bibles back at Matthew. Every temptation, something was said to Christ. Look at verse 3. Verse 3. Matthew 4, verse 3 says, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made. Let's stop right there. The devil's first goal, aim and goal, right here, where? On the sanctuary pattern. Y'all tell me. Let's, let's link the sanctuary to this. The sanctuary pattern. Where are you made the child of God? Right here at the bronze label. This is where you're given the new birth. And when you come up out the water, you're born again. You're a child of God. <coughs> if the devil can stop you here, if he can have you thinking that you're not good enough, mm -hmm. that, that you're really not in good terms with God, that what you did yesterday, you know, God really ain't going to keep that. Like, you know, you got to go do some things first. Mm -hmm. If he can get you to doubt that you're really a child of God, literally, then all of this means nothing. Reading your Bible. You say, Josh, what do you mean that means nothing? If you doubt that you're a child of God, you go, you, you, are you really going to believe the promises of the word that they're for you? You doubt. Are you going to come to him boldly in prayer? That, that, that he's going to answer your prayers? Why? Because you doubt. Are you going to be a shining light? This is why I used to fall short by my light. Let my temper get the best of me. And next thing I know, you know, somebody from the outside thing. Mm -hmm. He ain't no Christian. That's right. That's right. But I, I feel like I'm justified, though. That person said this to me and this, and this to me. I told my wife last night, I said, you know what? I said, ah, I just got to do Christ. Don't say nothing. I said, God, I said, don't say nothing. I can't. Certain things, I just can't say nothing. Because well. the minute I get to talking, there you go. Right. Right. But if I, if I don't remember that I'm a child of God, and know it in my heart that all of this is nothing. Could it be? I want y'all to notice something about every each one of the three temptations. That's verse three, right? Mm -hmm. Look at him at verse six. What else does this devil say in verse six? Go down to verse six. And said that to him, if thou be. Stop right there. That's before the other temptation. Now let's go down to the third one. Let's go down to the third one. Let me find it. Let me find it. Verse 8. No, verse 9. And said that to him, All these things will I give thee, if thou will fall down and worship me. Why is this if? Because like I said, if the devil can first, if he knew, if he could get Christ to believe that if. Yes. If he can get you to believe that if. It'll affect your daily walk. Mm -hmm. It'll right. affect your daily walk. As we get towards the end of this this part, why? You know, let's, there's one thing when you when you look at this temptation, though. When you look at this first, when you go back go back up the verse, because we're dealing just with the table of showbread, the transition from the labor to the showbread. Let's go back up to verse 1 of chapter 4. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit 
into the wilderness. God was willing to be led. Let me say this again. Jesus was willing to be led by someone else. <clears throat> How many of us are willing to be led by the Holy Spirit? Or we always feel like we know what's best for us. Hmm. Right. But here was God. Here Jesus laid a perfect example. If anybody could have told the Holy Spirit, hold on, I got this, it was Christ. He was God. But it said Jesus was led by God. Yes. Come on. So the first step in making the transition from a newborn into the holy place is you gotta allow God to lead you. You gotta allow God to lead you. And let's let's right here it also says in verse 1, then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Actually, <clears throat> Jesus didn't go looking for the temptation. Some of us, and I myself included, we think we're strong enough huh. where we can step and be with the temptation. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then we wonder why we fall. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Jesus did not go into the wilderness to meet the devil. The word, he actually went to go be alone and get ready for his mission. Yes. But it was the devil who saw him at a weak time right. and attacked him. And I'm going I'm to speed up and jump ahead. For time said, it's like we were talking about with food. What is table? We're talking about the table of showbread. And, it, and that's why I'm talking about the Sabbath school lesson. Because the bread is the word. Satan, some people always say, well, what does the health message have to do with salvation? Let's talk about it. What does the health message have to do with salvation? When well, the devil came to Christ, when Christ was at his physical weakness. How can you spread the word if your body's breaking down and hurt? How good can you spread That verse, and that's why I had us read the verse again, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. For all things, you whether you eat, drink, you see that? Whatsoever. And whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. How many of us partake on this table of showbread to the glory of God? Or do we eat for ourselves? Hmm. Now first I'm going to talk about the literally eat. I'm talking about the literally eat. How many of us can say that I eat for the glory of God? Because I'm talking about, I, even, even now, you know, when, when, when I'm at home a little more now, and I'm getting a little more out of shape, I'm like, baby, it's eating at my conscience. But the biggest tool from everywhere I've worked and now with my business, when I say, whenever I speak about the physical body to anybody or they ask me questions, they listen. Not because I got degrees and all that, like, because I, I dropped out of school, I was a high school dropout. No, because they see the proof is in the pudding. Mm. They see my physical body, they're like, okay, well he must know a little something. He exercises, he works out. Let me listen to what he got to say about the health message. Let me listen to what he say when he say, oh, you got to drink this or eat this and do this. <coughs> Are, 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 or are you willing to purpose in your heart to say, you know what? I'm going to take care of my body, God. So people will ask me when they see my face glowing and my face shining. I'm going to, uh, you know, so so I can use my, 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 my physical as a witness itself. And now let's take this also to the family, to the home. Now I'm skipping for time reasons. And, and, and my wife knows I'm not, this, this, you know, and I, I get on myself. But also I have talks with her, me and her, because I say, baby. I, I, I love you. I'm your husband. Are you just eating for yourself? <laughs> Can you eat for me too? Can you try to stay in shape and stuff for me too? Mm. I'm the one who's going to love you and hold you. Mm. Give me something, you know. I'm the one. Can you do it for me too? Or even in our homes, do we just eat for ourselves? <clears throat> Sometimes, I used to see that motto, you know, you get a mate, you get a spot. When you're single, you're looking good, you're going to the gym. But the minute you get somebody... <laughs> I go to the gym tomorrow. Why? Because you feel like you done got somebody now. Nah, you don't need to. You don't, you don't need to. Are you eating to yourself? Hmm. Or are you thinking, let me eat so I can be here a long time for my spouse? Let me take care of my body so the so 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 my children can look at me and, uh, or, you know, so I can be here a long time with them. We can't be eating to ourselves. Selfishly partaking at the table of showbread. Now I want to talk about it spiritually. 
that was the first temptation of Christ. Let me, let, me, let me read what she said about the first temptation of Christ. When Christ, with Christ, as with the Holy Parent Eden, mm -hmm. appetite was the ground of the first temptation in the garden. Is there a coincidence? Have you, are y'all starting to see a trend that, that God wraps his laws around food? <laughs> Just where the ruin began, the work of our redemption must begin. As by the indulgence of appetite, Adam fell. So by the denial of appetite, Christ must overcome. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in the hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. From the time of Adam to that of Christ, self-indulgence had increased the power of the appetites and passions. Self-indulgence had increased the power of the appetites and passions until they had almost unlimited control. This is where Josh falls short at times. I wonder why I can't control my temper? Because it haven't started in the kitchen yet. Wonder why this sin might be hard to let go? Because it have you haven't controlled it in the kitchen yet. Thus men have become debased and diseased. And of themselves, it was impossible for them to overcome. In man's behalf, Christ conquered by enduring the severest tests. But never let the society and other Christians in the world tell you, health and appetite means nothing. Holy Spirit just said, this was the severest test to Christ. It started with the appetite. What was the test in the Garden of Eden? Come on, God gives a sign that this is the severest test. The first test in the Garden had something to do with appetite. With, with Daniel. With Dan, when Daniel came into Babylon, aren't we in modern day Babylon? So Daniel's first test in Babylon was what? Tell him what? The appetite. If he had failed there, we wouldn't know of Daniel right now. Many of us, I'm talking about me. I felt uh, the tears. I told my wife and my daughter, Pray with me. That God take this from me. But I got to look at my steps. Okay, Josh, are you willing to help God out? I can pray, oh God, take this from me. Help me with this. But am I willing to take the steps to ensure? Or I, 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 I call it lazy Christian. God, you can do it. Go ahead and take this from me. You got it all, God. Take this from me. Could that be why Christ said that the children of the world are more wiser than the children of, in his own house? The children of God? Why could the children of the world hustle? Go get it. You got to go get it. Ain't nobody going to give it to you. Why can't we take that mentality with Christ? That same mentality that the, the children of the world got. I got to hustle. I got to go get it. Ain't nobody going to give it to me. Things of that nature. Can't take that mentality into God's house. I got to help God out. I got to get up. I got to go get it. I got to do it. Can't just sit around and just wait. Oh, I know I know God is all awesome and great, but he will put mustard behind your mustard. And you can have a hot dog. <laughs> a, 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 a veggie blend. <laughs> At this first victory were involved other issues that enter into all conflicts with the powers of darkness. You know, as I as I close, you know, I brought up manna to the kids. I brought up manna to the kids, you know. In the last days, our ability to fully depend and trust in the word will help determine our salvation. When you indulge in the passions, when you're at this table of showbread, how much do you truly trust in the word? How much do you truly trust in the word? You know, Christ, when, when, when he wouldn't turn that bread into stone, see, that also symbolizes how many of us come to the Bible for ourselves? Let me tell you what I'm talking about. We come to this Bible because we only have self in mind. I hope mm. I can live a long life. I hope I can prosper. Lord, please grant me all these things. We're basically asking for a miracle for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Could we be trying to turn stones 
into bread to fill our selfish desires. Not once did Christ do one miracle to benefit himself. So I had to ask myself, and this was tricky though, because God, you know, come to God in prayer, talk to him about things in your life. But I had to say, okay, how many miracles or things did I pray for this past year that was centered around everybody else but me? Did I truly pray or did I put my efforts into helping a miracle grow for somebody else or somebody else's life? Or, or mostly all my, my reading and my studying and my prayers just built for me to receive a miracle? Am I trying to turn stones into bread for myself? Remember, these are temptations for every Christian that they, that, that they must face. That when they come to this word, are you just reading it for yourself? One true sign that you're just reading it for yourself is that you're not sharing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One true sh sign that you are just reading this, you're eating this good bread for yourself, is that you're not sharing it. Because if you're reading for others, you're going to share what you get. Like, oh, that tastes good. Let me go get it sandwich. Like, what? Let me let the quiet read it. Let me let my friends out here get some of this good food. Right. It's dangerous, beloved. But that's what Satan wanted Christ to do. When he wanted Christ to, to turn that, that stone into bread, he wanted him to take the word of God selfishly for himself. That's what he wanted him to do. What is sad is most of us are still looking for miracles and signs to validate whether or not we're special to God. Hmm. Like I said, this is the transition. The devil wants you to doubt that you're truly a child of God. And one of those things is, is trying to still look for validation that you are a child of God. You have to know, just know that you are a child of God. Yeah. You are. No matter what mistakes you made yesterday, no matter what things went on in life, no matter what you've done, you are a child of the most high. <laughs> Skip it on. As I end, I'll save the rest for another part. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus. Go to Exodus. <laughs> there was a reason why I brought up manna to the children. <laughs> Manna was gathered how many times? Every day. Mm -hmm. Except on Saturday. Now I got to throw this out there. I got to throw this out there. Many of us, the devil has, has twisted. Y'all don't, don't mind, we, we study the word together, right? Mm -hmm. Many of us come to church looking to receive manna. And, and, and you know, and, and we'll even not come to church or we'll not, we'll say, I'm not going to hear that person speak because they don't serve the dish like I like it. You know, and things of that nature. Many of us only come to church to receive some good manna. Right. But I got a question for you. Did manna fall on Sabbath? No. Come on now, think with me. Let's listen to this. Manna didn't fall on Sabbath. That's right. So how come only on Sabbath we be looking for manna? That's right. Because it got it Friday. <laughs> no so exactly. Mm. On Friday, God, you supposed to gather your manna during the week. Yes. Yeah. You supposed to get your word in during the week. I see. So many people I've sat and heard say, man, I really didn't get out. I ain't really getting nothing from church. They say, okay, man, I don't fall on self. You ain't supposed to get nothing. Honestly, you supposed to bring something. That's why you got up Friday. You're supposed to gather double so you can come fellowship and share. Yes. You're supposed to come to church to share what you learned. Right now, I'm sharing what I've learned with y'all. This is something I learned to help me. I told my wife, I said, baby, this is to us. My wife said, this is to us. We're just sharing it. But, the, but too many times the devil has twisted our thinking into thinking this is the other way around. Mm -hmm. That throughout the week we're supposed to chill, get sampled, we go get mad. Mm -hmm. When really it's during the week you're supposed to gather your mad. Yeah. And Sabbath come and share it. Mm -hmm. Share what you learn. That's why I love Sabbath school. Mm -hmm. I told I told the pastor, Pastor mm -hmm. Bake, I'm, I'm gonna start uh mm -hmm. start training for elder at the Emmanuel Church, working with him at the Emmanuel Church. And so I told him, I want to be here more often. But I told him, I said, even after potluck, let's do another hour of Sabbath school. The Sabbath school ain't never long enough. 
Let's do it. After potluck, let's see. Let, tell me what you learned some more. Tell me how many times you can't finish out of school. The teacher try to rush it in. They got to rush it in. They don't know. You got 80 questions in your head. Or it's just stuff that you found out during the week that you wanted to do. Let's out of school. Let's finish it up. Why not? We got the Sabbath. It's the whole day. But let's get back to the manner. But like I said, God has a reason why God always has his laws and food almost in the, almost interchangeable. Let's look at, like I said, we're in Exodus. Let's go to Exodus, I want to say 16. Exodus 16. Exodus 16, and I'm going to uh, start at verse 25. Time's sake, I'm going to read. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days shall ye gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. You know, hard headed like we are. They went out anyway. What's the name first thing? And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments? And my laws. Here we see God is mentioning commandments and laws around the eating of bread. And doing what he said around the eating of bread. Hmm. Our appetites and our passions have everything to do with obedience. This was a quote I put on Facebook earlier this week just dealing with me. I saw it in myself. <laughs> If you can't control your appetite and passion, and I'm a very passionate person. That's why I say it had to do with me, and I saw this in myself. If you can't control your appetites and passions, your character is always open to be changed for the worse. Mm. Because in a split second, your passions can get you into something that you didn't see coming. Or your appetites can lead you down the wrong road. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit wish to make us empty of all sin so Satan can have no hold on us and no door to get in. Remember, you are. There is no if. <clears throat> there is no if. Remember, you are a child of God. There is no if thou be. You are. You are. If y'all could stand with, me. if you want, if you want God to say, you know, how many times, like I said, stressed before, how many times do we eat? How many times do we eat during the day? Yeah, two. Oh, oh, oh. I said it in the house. God, that's how many times God wants you to eat some of that word during the day. And, Eat five and meditate on it five more. I told my wife, I call it little and often. Read a little, but think about it often. Don't try to read whole chapters. I'm telling you, it works. Read a little, read like three, four verses, and then go meditate on what you read. Or while you're working, bring up those verses. Say, Holy Spirit, what are those verses I read before? And watch how those verses come back and you start to dig in them. The devil wants you to try to just read about three, four, five, six, seven, eight chapters. <laughs> Little and often. We need our bread. There's a transition between justification and sanctification. There's a war going on. The same way Satan released all of hell after Christ is coming after you too. He's coming after you too. But you have great help. You got great help. I'm telling you, you got great help. I want to be free. These chains in this bondage. You got great help. And he's so simple. He's so simple. He says, just eat a little prayer with me. Read the word. Talk to me a little bit every day. Try to shine in every area of your life. I'm telling y'all, there's nothing more beautiful than the blood of God and what he did for us. When he said, the mistakes you made yesterday, 
If you want to thank God with me that the mistakes you made yesterday, you're forgiven and you're cleansed today. That you don't have to carry them with you no more. The guilt, the shame, and the grip. Come down front. Let's hold hands and let's pray as we end. Thank you. If you're thankful. If you're thankful. Let's just say it's just a simple thing. Thank you. Thank you, Father. It's okay. It's, I'm telling you, I would not be able to stand in front of y'all right now. If it wasn't for this path. This sanctuary saved my life. And that's what I said. If I won't teach you nothing, I gotta teach you to save me. What helps me every day. It's a blessing. It's his house. The only piece of heaven that we have in the earth. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, we thank you for being King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Thank you for being so wonderful and so awesome. We thank you for giving us a little piece of heaven. Something that we can take home with us. Something that we can live by daily. A simple blueprint for us. We knew that your love for us would be so wonderful that you would make your house, your house, a, a blueprint of salvation. <laughs> oh Lord, you're, you're unexplainable. And your love is unimaginable. I thank you, Lord, for forgiving me and everyone here for cleansing us, Lord. Thank you for being willing to go through what you went through. We could never imagine what your blood had done to us and setting us free. We thank you, Lord, for your justifying. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for being willing to put us with, put up with us each day, dealing with our thoughts and our, our desires. It's no easy task. Oh, not even just for one so imagine a whole world Holy Spirit we thank you for being who you are for being loving as you are we thank you for your mercy none of us deserve your grace none of us deserve your mercy we thank you Father. you know each of our hearts here help us throughout the week help us throughout church every day in our homes and in our hearts that we may shine and come back and share some of the bread we got throughout the week. In your son's precious name, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.